Today, part two of my Goblin Warren on Dungeon Craft. This is the second part of my Goblin Adventure and the fourth in a series of videos that detail my campaign. If you're looking for the others, you can find links to them at the end of this video. Also, we update my campaign with videos on the first Thursday of every month. On other Thursdays, we post videos on crafting your own terrain, painting miniatures, and general DM tips. Today, I have two interesting concepts. One, how to design a dungeon without drawing a map. And two, how to design a cool villain. Notice I said cool villain and not big boss. I'm going to show you how to do it. Let's go to the table. The first session ended with the town of Grimhaven destroyed by marauders. The player characters, having no choice, need to seek out their fortune as adventurers. The second session ended when goblins ambushed the player characters and took them prisoner. The third episode ended with the player characters overcoming their goblin jailers and escaping. But now, without armor and without weapons, they need to find their way out. As an experiment, I'm going to do my map last, and instead of thinking it in terms of, of a map in space, I'm going to just think, what types of rooms would have to exist in a goblin complex? Obviously, you have prison cells because the characters start as prisoners. They also need a, a guard room, a common room, a kitchen. I imagine they have some sort of temple, a laboratory where they can create cool, crazy inventions. I'm imagining a cave filled with mushrooms. That's where the goblins, they use this fungus as their light source and also to eat it. They use it as vegetable matter. Now, for the big villain, I could make it, you know, the typical goblin king, but I think there's more opportunities if, if they can speak the same language. So I'm going to say that the main bad guy is actually a, an anthropologist from a university who's come to live among the goblins, and that can provide some cool role-playing opportunities for the characters. If you've ever been in a real cave, you know, aside from being really dark and cold, they're really disorienting, and I want to create a cave system where instead of a hard static map, it's it's like um, uh, almost random, where the characters can really get lost, and they don't know which way is which. I have these laser-cut wood bases for painting miniatures, and I put numbers on the other side, and these numbers correspond to the number of rooms in my dungeon. I shuffle them and deal them out face down in the center of the table. I explain to the players that the caverns are very maze-like and labyrinthine, and to represent this, when they go to a new area, they turn over a disc, and that will determine which room it is. Even the prison cells are included, and that means that the characters become so disoriented, they find themselves walking in a big circle. I stress to the players that if they don't want to enter a room, they can back out and choose a different direction, avoiding combat. So after the prison cells, the next thing I have to design is a guard room. There are six goblins, and they keep a giant centipede on a leash as an attack dog. Even when I'm designing something basic like a guard room, I try to make it a little different than every guard room the players have ever seen. In this case, the goblins are in a circle, and they're watching... Uh, two scorpions the size of hands sting each other to death and they're gambling on the outcome. Because the goblins are distracted, the characters can just avoid this encounter by doubling back if they choose. In my world, goblin weapons and armor are very rudimentary and they're made from things that the goblins can find. So blades are made of bone, you got catgut bows, lots of spears, and the armor is made of fur pelts and little scraps of leather. On a roll of natural one, any goblin weapon is going to shatter. Now, in terms of treasure, these goblins don't trade with humans, so there would be no reason for them to have metal coins. Instead, they use goblin currency, which is made from dried-out boogers and toenails, and every goblin is going to have a pocket full of them. When a goblin kills someone, they rip off their toenails, fingernails, and cut off their nose. This is how the humans in my world know that goblins have attacked a settlement. Next, I design the kitchen, because the goblins have to eat, and also, there's probably going to be weapons here. So I'm going to say there's one victim on a spit being roasted and a second victim who has been completely shaved of body hair and is in the process of being basted and seasoned. This room contains a roaring fireplace, some sacks and barrels, and several platters of human flesh arranged on long tables on either side of the room. In the center, using a huge cleaver made out of bone, is the chef. The other two goblins turn the spit. Clever players may ask if there are extra knives or a cleaver laying around. If so, yeah, there are enough knives for just the players who ask. If they're clever enough to ask if there's a fireplace poker near, yeah, give it to them. This is what's known as the rule of cool. I talked about it in my previous video. If something sounds cool and it's plausible, allow the player characters to get away with it. Always reward creativity. The temple is the center of goblin society and the place where the goblins come nearly every day to worship. 
It's the largest room, centrally located, lots of exits, has an altar on which is a giant goblin statue. When the characters enter the room, toss a six-sided die. On a one to three, there are two goblins keeping watch. On a four, five, or six, the goblins are in the middle of a ritual. During rituals, 3d6 plus six goblins are present. The highlight of the ceremony comes at the end when the shaman goes to a tabernacle on the altar and removes a giant, fat, white maggot. All the goblins fall to their knees and pay homage to what they believe is the physical manifestation of their god, the great grub. The shaman is responsible for caring for the grub and feeding it. After several years, the grub will expire and the shaman will attribute its death to the goblins being sinful and unworthy. A new grub will be chosen and raised, with the goblins praying faithfully every day that this one will be the final messiah. If the characters do witness a ritual, the next time they come through this room, they are going to find it's not occupied. This is important because if they're able to subdue the shaman and steal the grub, they can hold it hostage and the goblins will refrain from attacking them so long as the great grub is in their possession. Goblins are insane inventors, always creating gases and poisons that they can use on their victims, as well as interbreeding cave-dwelling insects and animals in order to weaponize them. This room contains tons of glass potion vials and balls, spheres filled with gas, also weird animal monster hybrids and tiny cages. At all times, this room is occupied by Dr. Pox, the goblin tribe's resident mad scientist, and his assistant measles. They're protected by one of Dr. Pox's inventions, a rat dog. The rat dog is hairless and a cross between a Doberman and a giant rat. They double as attack dogs and steeds for goblin riders. Dr. Pox has armor class 12, 9 hit points, and does damage either by his hands, which is 1, or he throws a ceramic ball filled with poison gas for 1 to 6. A difficulty 10 saving throw means half damage. Again, these characters are 0 level. If they were 1st level, I'd make the damage 2 to 12. This rat dog has armor class 14, has 8 hit points, and does d8 in damage, making him a very dangerous opponent. Just like in the kitchen, the fast-thinking player may ask if they can grab a potion and fling it, and the answer should be, sure. Why? Because it's cool. Consult the following chart. 6 is plus 1 strength, 5 is plus 1 armor class, 4 is plus 2 hit points, 3 is goblin urine and it causes the drinker or anyone hit with it to go blind, on a 2, the person drinking it turns into a goblin, and on 1, they explode. The effects last for an hour, unless you explode, then you're just dead. There's a hundred gold pieces of rare powders and fungi in jars in this room. Speaking of fungi, one of the rooms is filled with giant mushrooms. Some of these are phosphorescent. The goblins use these to make lanterns out of. They also use them for food. Some of the mushrooms, if ingested by humans, have hallucinogenic effects, and an apothecary will pay 10 to 20 gold pieces per bag of them. This room is guarded by one of Dr. Pox's creations, a giant cave spider, who's trained not to attack goblins. The Scholar is my primary role-playing encounter and my main villain. When the characters first enter this room, it's a surreal sight. It's got a four-poster bed, bookshelves, the walls are covered with drawings of goblin anatomy and notes about their hierarchical structures. Hunched over a writing desk is a Scholar who wears a plague doctor mask. If threatened, he holds aloft one of Dr. Pox's explosive potions and encourages the players to reason with him. Removing the mask, he introduces himself as Johann Brunner, a scholar from a nearby university. His interest in the goblins, he explains, is purely academic. Johann is extremely thin, pale, and he has enormously dilated black eyes from living underground so long. He offers the characters strange prickly cave fruits, which he eats himself, and some wine, which the goblins have recently stolen from a caravan. Then he cheerfully explains his story. He was originally hired to act as a physician to an adventuring party, but before they ever got to the dungeon, they were waylaid by goblins on the bone road. The goblins killed all the adventurers except Johan. Because he was wearing his plague doctor mask, they assumed he was a monster. He performed some sleight of hand magic tricks to impress the goblins and it worked, and he's been living with them ever since. His ultimate goal is to publish a book about living with the goblins and secure his place in the world of academia. During the conversation, if inquisitive players ask about details about the notes and the maps on the wall, you can allow their characters com to commit that map to memory. This will prove to be critical information because Johan brings them back to the temple where several dozen goblins step out of the shadows. He offers an apology, but says he simply can't allow the player characters to leave. Like many in academia, Johan is batshit crazy. He explains that the characters were to return to the service 
and reveal the location of the goblin lair, it might attract human invaders. He simply can't allow that. This is where having looked at or memorized the map will come in handy. Remember there are three exits in this room. Two of them lead deeper into the dungeon. One of them leads to the surface. If the characters have studied the map, they know the right way. And there are a couple of other ways the characters can escape this room without combat. If the characters lifted a potion from Dr. Pox's laboratory and brandish it, the goblins will back up because they're afraid of whatever potential hideous disease or horrific explosion it might unleash. If the characters manage to get their hands on the great grub, they can hold it hostage and force the goblins to let them go. Any of these ideas will provide the characters with an opportunity to escape without combat, or at least get a head start. Now you may have one of those players, and you know who they are, that think you need to attack everything, and they may attempt to attack Bruner. Allow them one die roll, then a dozen goblins swarm them and tear them limb from limb. The character's screaming dismemberment will provide an excellent distraction so the rest of the characters can run away. And if they still don't get the hint that they should run away, well, they just don't deserve to live. Describe the frantic foot race as the characters plunge headlong into the darkness, weaving through the corridors, trying to figure out which way to go, while goblin arrows, darts, and spears whiz by their heads. You could put an obstacle in the way if you'd like, like a rickety rope bridge or a bottomless chasm and force them to make dexterity checks, whatever makes the ending more cinematic. The exit is a mountain of skulls and bones the goblins use as stairs. The characters burst into the sunlight, exiting out the huge roots of an ancient tree. My players are pretty sharp and they asked if there were a log or a rock that they could use to plug the hole, and I allowed them to do that because of the rule of cool. So the characters in my game survive only to soon find themselves back on the Bone Road and still a half a day's journey from civilization. There are additional rooms, but we're pressed for time, so I'm not able to go over them. As for rewards, the characters get to choose whatever class they'd like, and they get to advance to first level, which will double or triple their hit points. And that's it. In my games, survival is often reward in and of itself. People have asked how I design boss fights, and this is a good example. I don't build a bunch of statistics and hit points and that kind of stuff. I think about the character and I think about what they want and it's opposed somehow to what the characters want. Bruner is just a zero level human. He probably only has four hit points. I didn't even include his statistics. He can die with one or two punches. The thing that makes him powerful is that he's got this influence over the goblins. That's what I want to get across, that you don't have to have the most powerful villain to be a memorable villain. In my game, Bruno lived, and that's great, because the most memorable villains are the ones that can return again and again. This is Professor Dungeon Master for Dungeon Craft. Thanks for watching. I'll see you at the table. And may all your rolls be 20s.